Okay, so we are now broadcasting and just waiting for uh, some folks to join the call. And I see the participants number is steadily climbing. So we'll give it just a few minutes before we get kicked off. All right, folks are streaming in. <laughs> we got so a batch of them, didn't we? Oh, what did you say, Mike? I said we got a batch of them, didn't we? We did, I know. We've got some really good registrations on this call from around the world. So this is exciting. So for everybody who's just joining us, we're gonna give it just another minute or so to allow a few more folks to join in before we get things kicked off. Okay. All right, we are reaching a critical mass. So this is great. So we will get everything started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kalia Garrido. I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. Um, so like, we are, we're really thrilled today with the attendance numbers that we have on this line. We have a lot of folks joining us and some from um, some uh, different areas around the world. So a little bit about who Great Data Minds is as we get everything kicked off. Great Data Minds is a collective of passionate data activists. We are on a mission to modernize the world of data. So we offer a full range of services in strategic planning, education, and deployment for critical data projects. Uh, we produce great content in the way of videos, podcasts, blogs, chronicles. We've got a lot of content coming out like that. We also do some um, really great events in person when we're uh, safe to do so, but also virtual events like we're here today. So a couple of um, upcoming events that are don't miss sessions that I just want to mention to you. Um, on May 7th, we're going to do a Technology Matters Marathon. So this is how you get to really be a fly on the wall and check out some cool new technology solutions that have already been fully vetted by Great Data Minds. Um, you can come for one session, you can join for a few, or you can come for them all. It's really your choice. You get to kind of select your own schedule on that day. That's really cool. Um, and we are also hosting a multi-day executive level workshop. That's going to start on June 10th. And this is going to provide you with the real deal how to for standing up a modern analytics program of your own. So that one's going to be great as well. Um, so really our goal with any of these events is to keep the data community connected, to keep it connected in Denver, Colorado, where a lot of us are uh, spanning out to, you know, across the United States and, and also across the world. So we're happy that everybody can join us uh, for those sessions virtually. So to find out what we're doing next or to stay abreast of that stuff, go to greatdataminds.com forward slash events. And if you haven't already done so, I highly suggest you sign up for our newsletter that will keep you totally abreast of all the cool things we have going on. And you can find us at greatdataminds.com for that. Um, okay, so some housekeeping items for today's session. We are gonna keep this conversation to about 45 or 50 minutes today. Um, everybody on the line is muted, but the Q&A and the chat are enabled. We're also recording today's session, so we can share it back out later. Um, feel free to send questions over as they arise. You can put them right into the um, chat bar. You can submit it as a question. You could probably also raise your hand. We have all the functionality. It's been turned on. It's ready for use. We're also going to do some polling. Um, so please participate, everybody, because we want to hear where you guys are coming in on uh, this uh, sort of controversial topic as well. So. In today's discussion, um, we are going to touch on technical architectures. And let me introduce our panelists. Um, these are the experts when it comes to every different facet of, uh, like we said, this controversial topic. So we have um, Hans Holtgren. He's the CEO of the Genesee Academy. He's going to be defending uh, Data Vault. Thank you for joining us, Hans. Great to be here. Uh, we have Scott Reagan. He's the CEO of Sensible Data Integrations, and he is going to be taking the position of defending traditional. Scott, thank you. Good morning. Good thank morning. You. We have Tyler Albritton. He's the managing director of the AE Group, and he's going to be defending the flattening. Thanks for the having me. Flattening. Yes. And for our esteemed moderator, um, you guys have likely seen this guy here before, this is Mike Lampa. He's our advisor extraordinaire here at Great Data Minds. Um, he's going to be today's official rabble rouser and instigator. That's right. We're so, going to stir it up. <laughs> let's get into it. All right, Mike, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, welcome, everyone. Gentlemen, 
it's good to see you and I'm looking forward to this chat. Uh, you know, it seems to me that we've been down a similar impasse about 20 years ago when we uh, watched the ideological wars, passionate debates go on between Inman and Kimball. You know, and here we are again, 20 years later, we're gonna, we're gonna hash out the merits of three different data architecture design techniques. And we're gonna decide once for all, once and for all, which one is best, or are we? So let's get into it. First, uh, maybe a little poll. Are the polls open? Yes, they are. We have the first so, poll open. All right, so please, which modeling technique or techniques are predominantly used for your analytic solutions? Please select all. Oh, they're coming yeah, in across, and it's across the board. Wait, I can't vote? Yeah. I just I took you that. guys off of this. You guys are opinionated oh. enough. We're going to hear oh. your opinion after. Oh. oh, you blocked me too. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking. I was looking for the yes option because I should just say yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So give it a few more seconds, and we'll cut it at about a minute. All right. Do you guys? Hey, should we should we share these results back with the audience? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, I'm gonna close it right there and let's see. Okay, let me work on doing that. So you guys All right, right to we'll it. get it. We'll get it. All right, so Scott. Um, I'm wondering about that one right approach, right? I mean, that's what many of us decided to do back in the turn of the century, wasn't it? What do you think, Scott? Uh, which century? The, the most recent century? Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I mean, I, I, I think it, actually the, the question of which one modeling technique is the right technique is, is actually a too narrowly focused question. The, the question really in my mind um, is what is the, the architecture that one should, should use? And that architecture should be logically connect, integrated, right? We should, we should logically have relationships amongst data. We should logically have consistency of technologies and that sort of thing so that we can leverage that environment. But there is no, in my opinion, there is no one single modeling pattern or technique that satisfies all needs because you have to think about ultimately at the end What's the value we're delivering to the business? It's, it still comes back to a value proposition, right? Yeah, what yeah, am I right. trying to support? I'm either trying to support ad hoc fast analytics, which is, I think, a, a big reason why in our poll we had, um, you know, the, the star and, and snowflake schemas, and it, because that's sort of the end point. That's, that's what is commonly um, understood to be a, a very good environment for reporting and analysis. But I may also be supporting integrations. I may just be supporting operational data that I'm trying to share in an ODS style kind of capability. I may be supporting data extracts because I have downstream processes. Uh, maybe I'm supporting data science, which means um, I want to have more of a blob storage data lake um, uh, kind of technology in place so that I can do fast acquisition and, and then maybe some, uh, some data science algorithms and that sort of thing. All right, so you talk so, about- So, it, so in my data. mind, it's not about one single model. It's all about within my integrated shared architecture, which models, plural, make sense um, so that I can deliver the right value, um, the right end user. All right, okay, guys. So Value and workloads or you know, di different consumption patterns. Hans, what, what would you add to that? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, having been working with the data vault stuff now for about 20 years, I mean, obviously we're, we're talking about one of these three aspects for modeling and for the implied architecture that goes with it. Um, I would say that, you know, we typically try to explain that, you know, it's, it's purpose built. You know, why are you doing it? You know, one, one of the facets that we're always talking to people about is, 
what are the requirements, what are the, what are the constraints, what are the variables that define what your particular data layer is looking for. So, you know, typically in operational systems, those are, are restricted in a way to things that have, have to enforce business rules, that have to have certain characteristics. If you look at the presentation layer, it's a different set of goals and requirements and constraints there. So we, we pretty commonly will say, well, let's model it a different way. The architecture can look different because the purpose is very different. And same thing is true for the data warehouse or whatever your enterprise integration layer is, whether it's like Scott saying, however it's deployed in whatever architecture, um, if its purpose is around integration, if it's around historization, if it's around being able to uh, audit back and keep a traceable record of where things came from so you know what you did to it, allow for easy business transformation. And I guess above all else in that layer is, is agility then uh, you need something different there. So I think we live in a world where we'll have different paradigms um, for, the, for different layers and different architectures. What we're seeing now, of course, is uh, the biggest, probably most important thing is, what does it mean? And do we understand what the data is? And that's probably, once you've accomplished that, then I think you're in a good place to deploy whatever you need to deploy. So. All right, all right, so I get it. Uh, we gotta consider the value that we're, going to be generated. We've got to consider the nature of the workloads that we're trying to support when we're picking the different techniques. We're hearing it's not a one, a one, one size fits all approach. Um, but it kind of strikes me that the evolution in technologies, um, um, both in the business applications as well as our data and analytics platforms, might have an influence on our modeling. Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, I think you know, both both the size of data, you know, as it's been growing over the last decade, as well as just the, the quick move in technology, both in the data space and the app space, I think definitely influenced decisions. Um, you know, I think there's there, there's even been a bit of a convergence, right, between what is data and what is application development, right? I mean, they used to be having, you know, spent a lot of time in the enterprise, right? You know, the, the data used to be this group that was off to the side, kind of doing their own thing. They had their own stack, their own technologies. And, you know, I think modern apps are wanting to see, you know, th those analytics in real time right within the app. There's this sort of this convergence apps, you know, it's not that the apps are developed first and then, then data follows. They're, they're thought of together. Um, and, you know, and also, you know, modern, modern app dev sort of is starting to use different technologies than they did a decade ago. If you think about um, you know, in mobile app development, um, there's a lot more services work. There's a lot more document databases that are sitting out there. These aren't the, uh, you know, the old relational databases that fit well into some of those other models. So when you, when you think about things sort of almost starting hierarchically or flat on the app side, um, those real time needs, you have this, this opportunity where, um, you know, all the data that you need with an application just kind of continues, right, to flow through right onto the data side so that those analytics can be built and, and pushed back into the application. So I think there is sort of this wider set of considerations that we need on the data analytical side now as, um, again, we're just, we're just much closer to the actual, you know, traditional apps themselves. Right, right. Cool. And, we, and Scott, what, what would you add to that? Uh, what would I add to that? That was a pretty good summary. Um, I think, it, it, you know, as, as I look at it as a BI guy, um, BI and, and guy. B, a BI guy, which, and actually business intelligence is kind of now starting to get, turn a little gray, uh, like some of us. Uh, so we need a new, we need a new term for it, data engineering or, you know, or, or something. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one thing that's always been true is horsepower can overcome a lot of deficiency. So, and in this case, um, there's, there's no doubt, I think, that with sufficient effort and sufficient horsepower, one can solve problems with using any of these models, right? Now, that doesn't imply that you, uh, you, you shouldn't actually be thoughtful and pick the right modeling pattern and the right technique to serve the purpose, but you could make a, a less than optimal choice and with sufficient horsepower, that problem can be largely overcome. Mm -hmm. From a pure performance standpoint, like a query performance standpoint, right? Functional uh, uh, consideration. 
But what it doesn't address and what technology still um, doesn't resolve for us fully is what are our maintenance considerations, right? So if we make a poor choice on modeling technique, we take on additional maintenance um, and there's no way around that. Whether you use a UI or you're directly in the database, you still have to manage the environment. Um, and it doesn't answer the, the nimbleness question, right? So again, if I make a poor modeling choice, my changing requirements coming my way, um, how, how responsive can I be? Right. right. And, and sheer horsepower doesn't solve that problem. So true that, true that. there's a yes. lot of aspects to technology to think about. Got it. Sorry. Um, yeah. So there's a technical debt concept that you just introduced there by making poor choice. You know, and I'm trying to keep this ship up and running. Uh, interesting. Um, you know, so Hans, I hear a lot of rhetoric out there around schema and read, right? No, no more schema on right. You know, we don't need no stinking data models, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's your thought on that? Um, no, everybody's correct. We don't need models. No, I, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> uh, no, I think when this uh, when this all started, you know, I think many of us and tons of people in, in this space, right, we're really trying to explain the reasons why the model is so important. I think a big part of that is it's the logical versus the physical side of this. I mean, I think uh, you know you can model anything, right? but then you just end up with a lot of things uh, that you may or may not understand if you don't know what it is. Um, so it's uh, Lars Frombach just posted a, an article um, again here about this garbage in gospel out, um, which uh, was really good to see again. I haven't seen it for a long time, but the thing is, you know, we get a lot of data that just piles in there. We don't know what it is. We don't know how, where it came from. We don't know, you know, how it holds together. And then we just have this gospel of, you know, diligent data coming out of these platforms, which is really not the case. And it, it's, in, from our perspective, of course, it's, you can use all these platforms. That's, that's a physical deployment uh, situation uh, and they work fine. And I think we're, we're going down a road that's not gonna suddenly turn around and go back to what we were doing before. We're going to a place where these kind of platforms will continue to persist and they'll grow. And, and not just things like schema read in general, but where that takes us like into streaming and into virtual uh, platforms. Um, that's, that's, I think we're moving there with fast speed these days. So we definitely will. But what it does call to attention is the idea that we probably need modeling much more now than we did before. Because now the, the logical side of the modeling is large and by way all there is. Uh, and we can apply that schema on top of data that's uh, in whatever platform. And of course, in a, in a 3 and F uh, environment, then the physical structures will help support it as well. In other environments, the physical structure doesn't really enforce it. We have to enforce it through the, through the modeling paradigm. So yeah. I think it's probably even more important now than before. Okay, all right, thank you. Tyler, what do you think? You need any stinking models? Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, I think as with all things in life, it depends, but it's, it's, it's somewhat of a philosophical question, right? I think sometimes we get confused, um, you know, with, with tradition and formality and modeling as meaning understanding, right? So, I, and, and I think there, there's, there's some that would say, you know, that, you know, schema on read or very flattened structures mean chaos and, and, and not understanding, right? So there's, there's, there's certainly no excuse for not understanding the data and not doing that analysis uh, to make sure that analytics or any other type of reporting that comes out the other end is meaningful. Um, you, you know, that said, I think, you know, when we talk about, I, I gave the example of, um, you know, modern apps, they have maybe some different data structures that are coming out of them, um, like, you know, a JSON document that's very hierarchical. Um, that's, that's what I would call semi-structured and, you know, eventually you're going to have to structure the data in order for it to be used or consumed by some, you know, analytical consumer downstream. You can't get away from that. Right. Um, does that mean you need a schema? Absolutely. At some point you're going to have to map things or else, you know, your users in Excel are going to be, you know, they're, <laughs> they're going to give you lots of complaints. <laughs> that necessarily mean you need a big model and you need to have a bunch of upfront time to figure out how all that breaks apart to solve your business problem? I don't know. I think, um, I think understanding and documentation, absolutely. There's no excuse for not having standards in sort of a, sort of a, a flattened, less focus on modeling world. All of that, all of those great pieces of enterprise rigor still belong. Um, but I think there are cases where 
um, you can get a lot of business value very quickly without expending the effort of, of that formal modeling. Yeah, okay, cool, thank you. All right, this next one I'm gonna have all three of you give me your thoughts on. Um, what about organizational uh, considerations or triggers, right? I mean, what must we keep our eyes on? Uh, uh, what do we need to be, you know, things that, like need for speed, uh, things like the, the, the shortening attention span of our analytical stakeholders. Um, are, I mean, are these the significant triggers that, that could influence what kind of data architectures we're using? Um, Scott, I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, why are we all here, right? I mean, if we're all here just in our data community and, and we're kind of showing off our technical chops, um, that's great for conferences and, and, and online events. But at the end of the day, the whole reason we're here is to be responsive to organizational needs. And so we do have to focus um, on and understand and, and accommodate those, kind of, those sorts of questions. And speed really comes in three forms. I mean, there's speed, you know, performance of the application or the environment at the end of the day, how quickly can I interact with it? There's also speed to delivery, right? How quickly can I get to value? Tyler was alluding to this uh, a moment ago. There's also speed in terms of nimbleness, how responsive, how fast can I be in responding to change? And so there's absolutely no question that, that we have to think about what the environment is up to. We have to think about change, which is the real driver. So it's absolutely reasonable for me to say, look, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna acquire data very quickly in a flattened way. I'm gonna do discovery in that environment, figure out what it is I care about very quickly. Maybe I throw that away. Maybe I do my analysis, I've answered my question, I move on. Maybe I found something that I care about and I care about it over time. Well, now I need to think about storing it, persisting it, understanding it in an auditable fashion. So now I have to think about modeling. Now I think about an ensemble model or maybe I go to a third normal form because I, maybe I don't care about history, but I do wanna put a schema on this and retain it because I have downstream processes. So mm -hmm. everything evolves, everything changes and if I go into the environment th understanding that, I'm not picking the one model and forcing everything to behave in the same way, all the data. Uh, I can now address the data at the point in time that I need to address it for the specific need and, and let the maturity happen so that I can move it and start to manage it in different ways as, the, as required by the organization, knowing that they're gonna change their mind and, yeah. and I may change direction, that's fine. As long as I do it properly and consistently, um, my patterns are correct, I'm good to go. All right. So there's, you, you're hinting on there's a need for some discipline there. Uh, Tyler, what, what do we have to keep our eye on from an organizational standpoint? Yeah, I think, I think Scott had a great summary. I mean, we can't lose track of fit, right? I mean, you have to, you know, as, as solutionist, right, you have to make sure that what you're going after actually fits the business problem at hand. I think... From an organizational perspective, I've seen more and more, it's, um, I think you kind of started it with the question, right? More, more, better, faster. So, you, you know, how do we do that in the data space or in the data analytical space? And I, I think there's, we were probably a little bit behind the other um, app dev techniques because we had all these big tool sets. We had big appliances, we had big Informatica servers. We had all this, this software in place that was sort of, in our hand and how we solved all of those solutions. And I think, um, you know, open source and cloud um, and just those agile notions that let you take advantage of both of those are, 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 are coming to the data space now. Mm -hmm. I think we can talk about things like continuous integration and continuous deployment. Um, we can make everything code. Sorry for people who love big fancy ETL tools, right? But we can do things in this space now because of these tools and technologies that I think allow us to do that um, certainly faster, cheaper than we were able to a decade ago. Um, and I, I keep going back to this, this notion that with, with that speed, um, there, there is expectation, right? So I think if you can talk about the, you know, the time it takes to traditionally do a data warehousing project, and even five years ago, I was in an enterprise environment, right, where we would run six to nine month projects. Um, 
I can, if I can focus on discrete business problems and put together a, a tailored solution to solve that in a couple of weeks, I can solve a lot of meaningful business problems very quickly. Mm -hmm. So as you break all of that stuff down to the simplest pieces, be agile, um, don't get locked into your infrastructure, don't get locked into your software, solve the problems. Um, I, think, I think you'll be better for it and you'll get back to giving that, that better, right? A lot faster for your business customers. All right, thank you. So uh, Scott, any? thoughts on what we got to keep our eye on, on organizationally? I think it's Hans. I've already given thoughts. I'm sorry. I'm I can sorry, give you Hans. more. I'm happy no, to no, give no. you more, Mike. No, you you're want. done, man. You're done. Uh, <laughs> sorry, fine. Fine. Go ahead, Hans. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it's interesting today because, you know, if, if you think about what's driving so much of what we do, it's that third factor uh, that Scott was mentioning when it comes to performance characteristics. You know, one is how well does it perform when it's up and running? How is how fast can I stand up something new? And then the agility factor is really, how well do I respond to change? How quick can I accommodate the new change? And we've definitely been working from that perspective on the physical side. So we have certainly tooling that will do that. We have project management techniques that will help us do that. We have techniques and testing that will help us do that and production moves that help us do that. But really I think the focus that's gonna be critical now is gonna be our ability to do that from a logical perspective Again, it comes back down to that meaning of what is it that we're working with. Mm -hmm. And like Tyler pointed out, look, we may not have time to build that big model. I would say we never have time to build that big model. If, you, if you're going to say, let's do a huge logical model and take two, three years to do it, I'd say, please don't. That's, that's a waste of time. Right. And by the time you get six months into it, it's going to need to change. And if it's not super agile, you're not getting anywhere. I mean, what we're doing now, and I think Scott mentioned it with Ensemble Logical, we're looking at ELM modeling, and it could be other forms. There's a new book by Steve Hoberman, it's great. There's other forms out there. But the thing is, focusing on the idea, of, can we be agile in quickly grasping the meaning of what we have and also what it is that we need so we can communicate that through a model that visually helps us communicate better, which is a model. You know? mm -hmm. And then in this case, the agility components of that model, not so much even physical, although certainly Vault and ensemble methods like Anchor and Focal really address that physical side, but also they address it from the logical side. Now, if in a two to six week window is what we're aiming at, we can get a, a subject area scope logical model so everyone understands the meaning of what it is they're working with, aim towards a common goal, map the data to it, make use of it, across all the architectures that support that integration layer, um, we can deploy that. And that's, right. I, I think that's what's exciting now. So I, I would see us focusing on that. Great, great. So as a data architect, I, I still have a job, I think, from what I'm hearing. From what I, 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 I would say without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, that's busy. awesome. You know, hey, uh, Kelly, let's do another poll. Do a Got quick it. poll, please. All right, I'm gonna let you guys vote this time, okay? So let's like- let's All see. right. <laughs> You've got power. Got it. <laughs> All right, we'll keep it up for about a minute. You see my big old paw here. We got some interesting questions coming in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> I like the last one. The only yeah. problem is that it's kind of virtual in that you can't really land a good blow virtually, right? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is this is Zim. Maybe we could put a boxing ring picture behind us or something. That just really the deal. You, can, you can put any picture you want these days. Yeah. All right, so how's All right. So, yeah, we'll close out the poll now, and yeah. I will share the results back with everybody. Oh, look at that. Use the chain. It's kind of edges out everything else. The de design principles and compliance of standards is still pretty strong, though, too. <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But it is across the board. So mm -hmm. kind of reinforces the points you guys were bringing up is 
I'm probably going to use multiple techniques because I got all these considerations that influence which technique. Cool. All right. Now, this is the fun part. <clears throat> um, help me understand, guys, each of the three approaches. We had, you know, kind of our general dialogue, but now I, I need you as an analytics uh, leader and or practitioner, why should I choose your particular modeling technique? What's in it for me to use that kind of modeling technique as an analytics leader? And uh, Hans, I'm gonna start with you in the data vault. Okay, great. Well, yeah, and just as a preface to it, I would say um, the things that I talk about with regard to data vault definitely apply to anchor modeling and focal and uh, several other techniques that are in the same family that all fall under the idea of this ensemble modeling, which is really uh, unified decomposition. It's breaking things apart into component parts, but still being able to retain uh, the integrity of that concept, you know, event, person, place, thing. Maintain the integrity by still maintaining a uh, key constraint so that we have a single instance uh, embodied. So that's a little bit of the kind of preface uh, technical background there. Um, I would say that um, for, for vault and for ensemble methods, uh, the biggest thing here is agility. I mean, we can talk about the other factors, but really responding to change is probably the number one thing. It's um, we're able to respond to change because we don't have the forms encapsulated. And that's true for logical, conceptual, physical, deployment design, whatever. I mean, it's, it helps us in the same way to be able to start with a foundational uh, concept, just its instance, nothing else, and then add to it relationships that deal with all different subject areas as we might integrate in a, in a data warehouse environment or other enterprise integration environment. Um, and then at the same time, add context in groupings that are logical, add them over time, where none of that requires re-engineering to use more of a physical, uh, I guess, way of looking at it, or beginning with uh, the first step where we have to know everything at once, which has never worked for us, not in a warehousing world. I mean, certainly, I think 3NF takes us to the you have to know everything at once scenario for a particular function particular area, partic particular operational support uh, process that's there. And that is practical because in order for that to work well and produce proper, uh, you know, system of record data, it needs to have the knowledge of that scope. In the warehouse, we don't have it. We will not have it day one. And even if you could magically get it day one, it will last days, hours, weeks <laughs> before the changes come. Yeah. We're integrating from multiple sources. Sources are constantly changing. Um, Global 2000 companies, I forget the statistic now, but there are five to seven merger acquisition activities per year. All these have additional systems and additional ways of working. We can't keep up with it if we don't do a decomposition of those forms, if we don't separate out to where we can uh, add things, bolt them on versus re-engineer, re-engineer, re-engineer constantly. So that's that's the biggest thing about this uh, platform. I think in more recent years, we've discovered some interesting things. One of them is uh, the vault and ensemble techniques are actually easier for business people to work with than potentially other techniques. And this has to do with, guess what, agility. Um, starting with the idea of the foundations of the things we model, whether it's physical or logical, are the same. They are those events, persons, places, things that we work with, those kind of noun things we've done for 40 years now, but pure business level. So we get those from an enterprise business view. We model those, we say, hey, you have a customer, you have sales, you have products. That's all you need to know right now. What are the natural business relationships between them that you've had forever? I mean, I like to say this, and I think it's really interesting. We could build an Elm model if Scott were able to pull off the time machine he's been working on, so we can actually go back in time to the year 1892 and say, okay, let's go to what exists there today, a global bank with operations in 14 different countries, with accounts, with guarantors, with policy. We've had all that. We've, we've always had all that. We've been able to manage all that way before computers. Mm -hmm. So the idea that those, I guess, logical conceptual models can be built with a business um, totally just 
not even taken into consideration the physical side yet. And then those can be built upon incrementally uh, and they can now become the blueprint for the physical model, which is of course practically where we store the data. So I would say, yeah, I mean, um, I could tell you, I would not be the person who would say, uh, Walt and ensemble methods are optimized for operational systems because we're not gonna really be able to embed in the actual data structures, the business rules that apply for operational purposes. Uh, I would say that they're pretty darn good uh, for things that have to do with uh, reporting and downstream uh, because uh, an, an ensemble based on say a product or a customer or whatever, is very much like a conformed dimension. Uh, the, only, the only real difference though, is that in the conformed dimension, we tend to then physicalize it into an encapsulated form or logically see it as an encapsulated form. Here we can see it as decomposed several table structures that work again under the same instance, the same key, which allows us a lot of freedom in being able to assemble what we need and Again, probably the biggest thing, build incrementally. Build all right. so we don't have to know it all at once. So it helps me embrace change. I heard that and and mm -hmm. it's consumable. It's understandable from the yep. information consumer. Okay. All right. So but uh, Scott, why would I stay with traditional? What's in it for me? <laughs> That's always the question. What's in it for me? Um, so traditional, uh, and, and interestingly, I, I just uh, kind of wrapped up a, a multi-month effort, and oftentimes in that effort, the, the term traditional was used. Um, insult is probably too strong a word, but it was sort of used as a, uh, a, as a negative. Oh, sure, that's the traditional way to do things. Well, there's a reason why things are traditional. Um, because they work. Um, if, they, if they didn't work, they wouldn't be traditional. We would have abandoned them. So uh, there's advantages in, in what we think of as traditional. Um, you know, a third normal form, good old fashioned database modeling concepts. Certainly it's the, it's the obvious best fit for um, operational transactional kinds of data, right? It's there to support functionality of whatever the application is doing. Um, it supplies all of the, uh, the, the functional support you need for metadata support, et cetera, right, for whatever that functionality is. It's well understood. I have armies of, of capable data uh, DBAs and data modelers, et cetera, who understand that technology, so it's a very comfortable space. Also, I would say if we expand the concept of data management beyond BI. Now, I, again, I'm the BI guy, so I tend to think in the BI terms, but I've also been around the block enough times to know that if I think of data management, it's not just BI. I'm not always trying to do reporting and analytics and, and the cool, sexy data science things. Sometimes I'm just trying to do data integration. I'm just trying to share data across systems or I'm just trying to produce an output because I have a regulatory requirement and, and I need to spit out some data to send off to, the, to a government entity or uh, the SEC or someone. And so there are reasons why my comfortable third normal form and just acquiring data out of an application, storing it in a very comfortable way, and then sharing it or moving it makes all the sense in the world and I don't necessarily have to take on the effort of training people, um, which is a real effort, right? Training people to understand how do I think about ensemble modeling? And by the way, um, that training is available um, and, and, and those patterns are well understood. I'm not suggesting that that's a, a, a climbing a mountain, um, although it is actually up a mountain. But in any case, uh, where the training takes place, but in any case, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily always need to, to take on that effort and create that skill set within my organization. Um, likewise, with blob storage, big, big data kind of concepts, where they make sense, absolutely we should, we should consider that, but understand that I don't necessarily have that skill in my organization today. I have to go acquire it. If I can justify that, if there's a purpose and a reason for that and there's value there, then I should do it. 
But if the answer is that my particular need doesn't require that set of capabilities, if my, I can answer my need in my very comfortable sort of traditional behavior, there's no reason I shouldn't do that and I shouldn't have to apologize for using a traditional technique. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. And even in a more mature environment that has all of those capabilities serving different purposes, there is absolutely still a place for good old fashioned data modeling and database management. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna keep my uh, skills intact and I'm delivering working software instead of going through training is what I'm hearing. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, I think it's the best of both worlds because you have the advantage of saying, look, I, it's not that I abandon all of those, again, traditional, and I'm air quoting, I don't know if that's coming up on screen, but, you know, my, my uh, old fashioned traditional skills, I'm not abandoning those and moving into a completely new technology. Those skills come along with me, right? Certainly when we talk about um, ensemble modeling, um, once you sort of were exposed to it, you realize, well, geez, I already have a lot of these skills. This is just a new philosophy, right? But I can still leverage all of that. Yeah. There's still a place for those skills. Can I leverage those skills into a, a flattened uh, or big data or blob storage environment into dimensions and facts in a Kimball environment? Yes, all of those skills cross those lines. And so I can both leverage my, my over a couple of decades acquired skills if I have, if I've lived that long, uh, but I can also start to move in and, and leverage new technologies as well. But I should only do that uh, either as a career move because I think that's where the jobs are um, or because I've identified there's a specific reason. For me. Yeah. There's a need here and, I, and this technology helps me address that. All right, I heard Flatten get mentioned there at the tail end of Scott's commentary. Tyler, what's in it for me with this Flatten that crap out stuff? Right. Yeah, you know, I, I will I will give um, Scott some props there in the end. I think I think <laughs> sometimes we get a little too excited, right, when the, the next technology thing you know moves on, and we we can't ignore the value of that legacy experience. Um, to, to get things done. I think, I think the, the whole Hadoop cycle, if I can call it that, um, is, is, is case in point, right? Everyone, everyone had to have one. It's like, hey, all you BI people, come do this. And they're like, wait, this, what? I have to make all my tables? Wait, this doesn't work? I can't put a model in this way? You know, we spent years and a lot of money trying to make people do things that we thought um, would be really easy for them to do, and, and it wasn't. Um, so, so that aside, I, I, I'm a very simple person. And I think, um, you know, notionally, there's, there's, there's nothing more simple to understand than a nice, wide, denormalized table with a bunch of information. You have to understand what it is and what its grain is. And anyone can do anything with it, whether you're an advanced PhD data scientist, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. If you're a brand new, um, you know, out of college BI analyst and you want to look at some stuff in Excel, those same data sets, um, you know, again, if they're documented and understood, can, can meet the entire gamut of use cases between those two. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I didn't mention before is portability. You know, I talked a little bit about the Hadoop technology landscape. Um, you know, sometimes in the, kind of the downside of that traditional or that legacy is we sort of get pigeonholed into a set of tools and technologies. And as things change, it's a lot harder for us to get out of them and to move on to the next. Um, you know, one of the great things about flattened structure, whether it's in some old Exadata instance or whether it's sitting in object storage somewhere is those structures are very easy to move around. And then and in the modern cloud space, you know, even easier if you need to change providers or you need to think about changing big data technologies or small data technologies, it's very easy to move those conceptual things across. Um, you know, another, another thing I'm surprised it didn't come up, um, you know, another thing a lot of people say is advocating, you know, um, the traditional approach or like a data vault approach is, hey, we're, we're worried that people are gonna do the wrong things with the data. I hear that, that argument a lot. And, um, and that's true. I mean, certainly you can make a big mess out of flattened data, but I would argue you can make a big mess 
out of data that exists in any set of structures or, or that were built with any set of modeling techniques with the best documentation on it. Um, you know, I think we lack general statistical literacy, both like culturally and then with, within the enterprise. And you can make a lot of mistakes regardless of, of how your data are stored. I think, I think, again, I like to go towards the simple because I think it's easier to explain. Some of those big even logical models are a struggle for people who don't have a little bit of nerd in the background, um, you know, on the business side, helping them, helping them to navigate through all that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, case in point, I, I, I feel like over the last month, as we've all been dealing with this COVID thing, um, you know, I've, I feel like I've been giving stats one one classes to friends and family as everyone's freaking out about this mortality rate. And I have to explain to them what, what good statistical indicators and bad ones are and what the appropriate way to use stuff. Um, I, I often, when I go into to businesses, do the same type of thing. You know, I think if, if people could focus a tremendous amount of energy on getting people to understand business problems, not understand that, hey, if I had this big, beautiful customer 360 model, I'd be able to solve all my problems. I think it's very hard for people to actually relate something big in an effort like that and a modeling effort like that to the potential future benefits. I think if you can get people to know organizationally how to in a very discreet way, explain a business problem, ex explain their hypothesis around, you know, around why it exists, some of their ideas on how to fix it. I think that the whole sort of flattened, very quick sort of methodology very much aligns with that because you can take these small things and you can fix them very quickly and move on. And um, one of the things that I've seen a lot over the last few years is if you don't have all these constraints, it's very easy to take that business centric approach to identify it and fix it and move on. And you can iterate on that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and may maybe there's an opportunity for some enterprise regular to go back in and say, hey, a couple of these problems were sort of solved using the same set of data. Maybe we need to pull some of that together. But I find that that speed and that value add um, is, is very important. That's frankly what's driven me um, and I'll just say it, it's, it's, it's supporting that business solve. It's having the technology and tools that I can move very, very quickly, get data in, get answers out. That's resulted in, in me flattening things more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's face it, like with all these other techniques, at the end of the day, come on, you guys are using views or materialized tables. Everyone's denormalizing and flattening it out at the end of the day. Uh, it, at the end of the day anyway, to get it to their users. Sorry, that was my little punch for Julie. I had to come up with something. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I think, I think, you know, to, to, to close real quick, I mean, it's, it's all about aligning to, to your customer's need, but I do think that just because it's new and looks chaotic, I think a lot of people toss it out, but I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity for the speed that flattening provides. All right. All right. <laughs> Great. So here's what I think I've got convinced on as an analytics leader. I might do a little bit of each. <laughs> yeah, and, and Tyler's going to take all the credit because at the very last layer, <laughs> flatten it, and he's, and he's the one that gets to go to the party. He's the one that generates the value. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. But wait a minute, you know, I, I heard... Right? Yeah, yeah, I heard earlier though, Hans, that you said the businesses can really easily consume these ensembles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I have to, you know, because we have to have some punches in here, Tyler, I got to disagree with you on the time it takes and uh, another uh, person listening in also wrote the same thing. Um, I, I think that uh, just because in the past, codifying that business information into some kind of a logical model to understand what the data is, which is a quick way of saying it, has been tough to do. And to say now that, well, because it takes a long time and it's been tough to do, we're just gonna get value from using the data before we fully know what it is. I think that's that trivializes it. I think it's critical that we have to know what it is. And our charge now is just saying, look, you made everything else agile. You've also got to make that logical business connection, knowing the data, what's the meaning of the data. You have to make that agile as well. I mean, I like uh, Len Silverson's quote, he said, if you don't understand the data, it can only be less useful or dangerous. 
And I think that's a really good way of putting it. I, I'd like Lars's point about garbage in, gospel out. I mean, once it's coming out of that system and you say, well, that's gospel, that's good. I, I made a good decision from it. But you really don't know what it is. You run into a huge problem. I think that's a huge risk for our industry. And we can't allow that to happen. So I think, I think we really need to figure out how do we get that business meaning around that data so it makes good sense and do that in an agile way that does not hold us up. Response, Tyler? Oh yeah, I mean, I, th I think that that kind of goes to my point. I think I think I, I don't think we give people enough credit for their ability to ascertain and understand business processes and ask good questions, and um, and learn about data very quickly. I think there's again, even 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 the word vault, I kind of don't like. Like, let's lock the data up and keep it protected for these people that might use it the wrong way. I think I think you know, there's a bunch of smart people in the business. And I think if you have, again, if you, if you have people that know how to ask good questions and understand business problems, those people know how to talk to others. They know how to, you know, examine operational systems. They know how to read process documents. They know how to learn really, really quickly um, to be able to support the type of problems that they want to solve. So I, I have seen a lot of value with people moving um, very quickly. Can the mistakes be made? Sure. I, I, again, I would argue that mistakes could be made no matter how wonderfully, um, you know, oriented data would be in a model too. Oh, I, I do think yeah. we're human. Yeah. So I Scott, think those people are definitely out there, but I think we also have the situation where we overestimate their capabilities as well. And not just because they aren't sharp, but because they really just don't know what it is they're working with. And that could be a semantics gap. It could be an issue of green. It could be a reliability, veracity, whatever. They just don't know. Sure. Scott, you want yeah, to throw I, a blow in there? Uh, uh, how about I shoot an arrow into there? Uh, uh, because, because I think it's, it, it's pointing into the spear, right? Or pointing end of, of the arrow. It, it's a question of methodology and approach. I mean, it, the, the points that are being made is we have to have some sort of clarity and understanding of data. We have to have data management. Those concepts are, are, are again, have been around, um, have existed and are still true today. But we also want to be responsive and we want to address the business need. The question is, how do I, how do I get there? Do I say, okay, step one, uh, let's do a, a full analysis and full is flexible, but let's do sufficient analysis. Then let's build out a model. Then let's deliver uh, data with a, a dictionary and clarity and understanding and all of that. Well, by the time I've gotten to that, if I'm if I'm not moving very quickly, the need has moved on. Right, the the organization flows like a river, and they're you know a mile downstream. However, can I take a very expeditious approach without full understanding necessarily, but can I build very quickly, whether that's flattened or third normal form or whatever the heck um, form that data takes to address the need at the moment and then harvest the result of that effort and begin to evolve and build out my uh, absolutely valuable and necessary and important um, EDW concept, uh, a data mark concept, can I formalize that? So I've got the pointy end of the spear is addressing the, the need immediately and quickly, even in the absence of full understanding, um, and then harvest from that a more clear understanding of what I really care about and, and basically build from the business back in the technology stack and let that evolve in that way. I think that's probably the right answer. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I used to have a picture that I, I, I would share kind of outlining some agile data notions and it would start with, you know, figure out a problem, go get data to, you know, confirm your theories and hypotheses about that problem, solve your problem. Um, and then that last step is share. And, and that, that share was really around, okay, we've, we've, uh, we've created a set of data to support our problem solve. And now we need to make sure that it's understood. And, you know, I've kind of said that throughout that, you know, flattening doesn't mean chaos and a whole bunch of, you know, uh, micro IT projects spanning all over the data world within an enterprise. Um, there still needs to be discipline. There still needs to be standards. Um, and there, there still needs to be, you know, definitions and explanations of, of what the data do. There's, there's 
there, there's no way to get around that. It's just, I think, you know, as we've been talking, it's, it's you know, how do you get there? Right, right, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. I mean, again, I, I think it's, uh, uh, Tyler's a bit trivialized there. I mean, I think if, if that's a process that takes too much time, then saying, yeah, we have to have it eventually or it's gonna happen magically anyway, it's not true. It's it's not going to just happen magically if we don't plan. Every two it. weeks, I, I would argue that, that we need to we need to at least know where we're starting from, and know what we're aiming at. And I think that process probably can't be any faster than if we were to use uh, ensemble logical and some kind of a vault as a or or other form of ensemble like anchor vocal. I think there's there's no faster way, and that gets back down to the idea that this technique, if nothing else ties to business very closely, and it's agile. And in other news, it's agile. It's, it's just freaking fast. And I think that's the thing that we need to be able to say is connect to business, know what the data is, do it fast. It's not about waiting for uh, some grandiose process and all this, you know, yeah. dot the I's and cross the T's stuff to happen. So, Kalia, uh, make a note. I think we need the next uh, event needs to be a hackathon. We're going, to get, yeah. we're going to get these guys a hunk of data and right? a business problem. <laughs> Test it that 40 way. 40 minutes. Right? I've got a set of business users yeah. and then some data and then go from there. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, this is awesome. Yeah. And this is a great conversation. And, we have, and we've got a lot of questions that are flowing in too on the chat. So I know we're um, about, we've got about five minutes to go on the call. So just asking the attendees if everybody wants if anybody wants to stay on and continue the conversation can you raise your hand in um uh in the zoom ui um it seems like we've got a lot of good yeah we're seeing a lot a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff coming in so that's good so then we'll, we'll keep it on for the people that want to continue the conversation but let me throw some of these questions at you guys we've got some good stuff coming in here right. and i feel like tyler specifically you're you got some pe people are coming at you yeah. I'm just going to let you know. So we have Jed Summerton. And this as we would said, have expected. As we would have expected, Mr. No Apologies. Yeah. Makes total sense. All right. Um, okay. So Jed is asking, I think the schema slows us down. Think a thing about a lake and flattened denorm table is crap because that's what you'll get from a bunch of cowboy users. Tyler says, as long as it's fully documented, as if cowboys read documentation. So how do you keep sanity and quality? Great question, Jed. Thank you. Yeah, well, so, so I think I think he's ignoring kind of my primary point, which is you can't do anything in life without some type of standard and rigor and discipline around what you do. So, so we didn't have a lot of an opportunity, right, to talk about agile, um, but you know, there's there's time bound things. Uh, we do automated testing. We do continuous integration and delivery of our data and our analytics and our visuals. This all happens in two week sprints. So there's, there's just because it's flat doesn't mean there's not a process to govern the quality of those deliverables that your customers are seeing and playing with two weeks later. It's very incremental. Um, I would agree with Hans that, you know, when you, when you have a methodology that allows you to build on what you did not that long ago, um, you can accomplish a lot. But just like any agile effort, right, if you do part of it, you're probably going to fail, right? You know, in, in my kind of app dev part of my uh, experience, right? When, when people start to do agile and they're like, hey, we really like this agile thing, but we really hate automated tests. It's not gonna work. Uh, we really don't like getting clarity with our stakeholders on stories. Like it's not gonna work. It's the same with this. It's the same with, um, you know, vault or traditional methods, right? If, you're, if, you're, if you don't have the discipline to follow the process and to get concurrence from business stakeholders all the way back through IT to the developer on that process, yeah, you're gonna run into trouble and chaos. But, um, but yeah, the, the, the approach with discipline, it, it works. I do it all the time. All right. Kelly, should we do one quick poll for the folks that are gonna be dropping off? Ah, yes, good, good, yeah. good point. Let's launch that yeah. poll now. Okay. All right, that's on there. So we just want to see everybody's thoughts and feelings on the uh, um, value of this session, and if everybody liked it. I love love all the questions that are coming in. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna vote very valuable, Kaylee. <laughs> hey, we agree. <laughs> I couldn't I, vote this time. <laughs> I took your permissions away, Mike. That was not by accident. Darn it. 
Um, okay, so while we're doing this, so we have, a, there's some other questions coming in. There's a lot, a lot of great chat and we're gonna capture all this stuff. So if we can't get to your points on this conversation, then we'll certainly um, capture it and uh, respond later. But I, we do we have a question that came in. Hmm? Uh, I'm sorry, we could do a readout later too. We oh yeah, absolutely. The, the unanswered but, questions. Yeah, it's, you know, there's great conversation. Yep. Really good. Yep. Okay, so Robert asked early on in the session, he's, uh, Robert Bain, he says, which of the three is best then at semantic disambiguation? Consistency of granularity, consensus management, or control of bias? Ensemble. <laughs> hey, if you ask the question, you get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how, how's, how's Ensemble handle that control of bias? That's a, that's a fun checkbox. I, I think the thing is having a single instance that you can point to to have uniformity around it but also understanding that there could be different interpretations. So for example, in warehousing, I would say today, we're really not looking at the goal of full integration of data because it's really not fully possible when you have different business units and divisions that see things in a slightly different way. But what we can do is have integration, some form of alignment, and then be able to reconcile that data. And that's really where the decomposition of a, of a concept, it has its sweet spot. You know, again, besides the agility factor, but I can have these now aligned through linked relations. I can have them aligned through interpretations of different satellite attribution. And that would actually help us to uh, maintain still a centralized common view, but taking into account uh, the different uh, interpretations that different business units have. I mean, the big example I always use is uh, if you're a sales team, you go out and sell a new contract, you get it signed, it's a sale, you get a commission, that's great. Legal, accounting, finance don't have any information yet. They don't have a new customer. Well, great. That doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. We still have the same essence of what is that concept. We just need to look at the different interpretations and be able to align them and reconcile that data. And again, I think that's for Ensemble as a sweet spot. It's making that pitch. I think it depends on purpose. I mean, it all goes back to the purpose um, because I can make the argument that the answer to that question is yes. Meaning that I can, I can come up in, in our debate club here, I can come up with this is how I would handle it in this modeling technique, that modeling technique. It would be, it would be logical constraints and, and, and versus physical ones. It would be, uh, you know, how do I change, how do I deal with changes in granularity and changes in cardinality? Well, I can deal with those changes in any of the modeling techniques. There is no technical barrier to me having an answer. The question is, what's the level of effort, right? And, and, and I think when you get to a more formal, um, and I'm using formal in a very broad context here, but when I talk about an ensemble model, for instance, I get a nice benefit in the sense that I have auditability and, 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 it's a, and I understand exactly what's been done historically, assuming I follow the pattern and do it correctly. Um, so that's a that's a nice advantage, and and if I have that environment, great, good for me. In a third normal form or traditional environment, I can absolutely deal with with um, the evolution of all of those concepts. Now I take on more of a maintenance and in, in data management, and you know you know what's the cost of actually being accommodating of those concerns. Right. So yeah, I, I can have an answer in any of the three techniques. It still all comes down to why does that model exist in my environment? It exists to serve a specific purpose. And if I've made that choice correctly, then I simply apply the techniques that are necessary to accommodate these, these questions within that environment, right? And I, I don't, there isn't necessarily one better than the other in that context, it's one is better than the other, depending upon what my ultimate purpose is. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, Scott, the thing is, it gets down to purpose, right? So if one of the purposes is you want to keep it over time, if you want to keep that model over time, then as uh, Patrick Lager just pointed out in here too, it's about the maintenance, because now it's going to change. So when, when it changes, what kind of maintenance effort are we talking about if the paradigm is not agile to begin with? And that's, that's, I think, one of the questions. Now, again, you can make the argument, we don't care. Uh, we're not going to keep it. We just want to answer a question today. We'll put it together, hope it makes sense. And then, well, we will make it make sense with whatever technique. But then again, tomorrow, if it changes, we don't care. We just, 
it's not about history. It's not about what we did yesterday. Um, and if that's the purpose, then maybe it is fine. But uh, I, I would argue in integration, integration historization, warehousing, um, we need to consider what happens next. You know, our time window is not now. Our time window is now and the foreseeable future of the value of that asset we're building. Yeah. Fair enough if warehousing is your purpose. Um, I'm expanding my definition of this, of the overall architecture to include um, things like integration, uh, thing, other purposes that are not warehousing purposes, in which case, to your point, I don't care about history. I, I care about um, capturing most recent data, integrating and moving that data. It's a, it's a different set of considerations, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a different set of purposes. So, so Tyler, you know, the, the, um, Hans is making the case for, you know, this agility to change, you know, where it can easily augment and enrich and, you know, both in breadth and depth. Um, in the flat net crap out approach, how, how does that embrace change uh, to the degree that Hans was sharing? Yeah, no, I, how, it's, yeah. I, I mean, there, it's, it's pretty easy to augment flat structures with additional columns, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's very, very quick. So, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't pursue, frankly, anything here without an agile methodology governing it, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, and that's probably an entirely different discussion on what that looks like in data. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but that, that allow, allows us to move pretty quickly. I, you know, I, I think an, another thing um, that I've found is, is, is that flattening kind of lends itself to a different set of tools, a different set of big data tools, right? Which um, just their architectural underpinnings, I'll uh, take you know, like, like a Google BigQuery, for example, um, or even a Hadoop, right? They, they, they frankly really, really like things really, really wide and really, really denormalized. Um, in other words, they like things flat. Um, you know, it gives you some opportunities to take vast amounts of data. So um, did, did a project for, uh, I won't throw, throw the name out, but, you know, casual dining place, right? So, you know, a couple thousand stores across the country and they were really trying to get a better handle on improving processes in the kitchen, right? So um, it wasn't just about the order and analyzing that order historically. It was about all the different iterations of that order and how it was changing over time. Um, and, and as they started to develop models, they wanted to start to be able to get that feedback back real time. So when you, you talk about, again, something that sort of starts flat, and you want to look at, you know, not, not millions of transactions a day, but millions of transactions potentially a minute as all these little nits and orders are changing. Um, and as they augment that, because that was an agile process building that application, it was very easy for us to adapt and, and you know, kind of augment that ordering model, if you will, uh, to be able to handle more and more use cases after it. So, so flat doesn't, doesn't mean, you know, just for the short term. Um, it, 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 it also doesn't mean that, you know, it's not easy to change. It's kind of one and done. I think, I think as you um, kind of really went back to Scott said, as you, you know, you still have to align it to that business problem and what you're trying to solve. But, but I think if you have uh, that kind of organizational discipline, I think you can do any of these effectively and do them, um, you know, agilely and quickly. Yeah. You, you, you've hit on that a couple of times, you know, taken um, a true, well conceived and orchestrated agile approach that can yeah. ultimately I mean, that's scale me. like, is, I, is critical. I hate operations. I I had I had those roles in big IT organizations where wait, what happened on the Exadata box? Crap, we didn't do what? We didn't see I hate operations, period. <laughs> so everything we build is are we perfect? No, but we're targeting that no operations, right? So so I, I'm not um, advocating flattening so I can give it off to someone else and let it break and not be maintainable. These things, uh, that's why we do the automated testing, right? That's why we do the automated deployment across these environments is to get all those benefits um, that other application, you know, developers get so that, uh, you know, releases and production, you know, management maintenance can be, can be non-issues for us. And that, that can happen with, with, with flattened approaches. Right. Okay, we've got another question. Yeah, I feel like we keep right. shooting at Tyler. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Finish, finish your thought, Hans. Hans? Yeah, I was going to say, I feel like we keep shooting at Tyler, so I, I <laughs> tend to shoot more at you. But I guess the thing I would say is that um, 
look, I think from the flattened approach, you know, when we're going into delivery and you're, you're bringing stuff out, it collapses. It, it's, it, it goes into all kinds of forms. And I think that's critical for, for getting stuff out there. Maybe not so, maybe critical is not the right word, but I think it's very common. It's useful there. I think the thing just to recognize is that if we're using that as our, as our layer, as our layer for persisted, historized, integrated data, I think that's where the thing starts to fall apart. And I think a lot of the comments that have come in um, from Stefan Verzel, from uh, Paul Teglogger, from others, uh, Jed, Summerton, those people, you know, relate to that uh, issue. And uh, so it's more a matter of, look, you know, are, where are you placing this paradigm, uh, logically and physically, in what part of the architecture are you putting it? And um, I would say uh, the danger is, and what we've seen, of course, is if you're, if you're trying to make your enterprise platform for historized data integrated from multiple sources in a, in a flattened environment without the advantages of the schemas that support what meaning you have and how does it work together, especially linked relations and, and how that data joins together is, is critical. So we need to have that later. Cool. I got another one more, Kayla. I think, I think we'll wrap it now. Um, okay. Mike, We've got, I mean, everybody's staying on. Like, we still have really good participation on. We're going to keep that chat um, actually open, um, you know, kind of beyond, uh, beyond the, the set time. And I really appreciate everybody staying on. This has been a great conversation. Um, so if you want to continue the discussion, please go ahead and um, enter your uh, thoughts, opinions, uh, jabs at Tyler. Uh, right, right into that chat box. Should I be reading this chat? I have not been paying attention. <laughs> no, actually, uh, we're hiding the chat from you, Tyler. <laughs> it was all part of a plan. It's hey, Kelly, hey, if I could introduce one one word here right at the end, and I know yeah. we're we're getting ready to wrap up, but the uh -huh. the word as as this conversation has has been, has gone along, and there's a lot of questions with regard to okay, well, it sounds like maybe I need a bit of you know one one of each. Um, in my architecture, how do I manage all of that? The, the word that I would put out there, and this may spawn a whole nother um, discussion, um, is modularity, right? So when I envision an architecture, I envision an architecture that is not a domino-based architecture where all my data has to pass through the same order of execution and, and through this pre-described pipeline where all the dominoes have to fall to get to the ultimate end. I think of a modular architecture where I have an acquisition capability and I have a master data management capability and I have a, a consumption zone, right? Which is maybe flattened, right? Maybe it's a dimensional model. I have a, a curated zone, which is a, an ensemble model or maybe a, 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 corp, a data factory, whatever choice I make on modeling. But I think of them as being um, related and available and capable modular sets of functionality and purpose so that as I try to address a business problem, I can stand back and say, well, how do I need that data to move in the environment? Which of these components do I need to incorporate into solving this problem? And if I can decouple and modularize that set, those sets of capability, now I, now I can manage. I do have to have discipline. And if I don't have discipline, there will be discipline um, of a different form. <laughs> but I do still have to have discipline. But if I can have discipline in that environment, then I can basically do whatever I need to do in a rational way. Right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you. Amazing dialogue, oh. guys. Yeah, this has been awesome. So Mike, Tyler, Hans, Scott, thank you all so much for joining us and for sharing your expertise. It's been a great conversation. And then to all of the attendees, we still have a really significant number on the line, despite the fact that we're about 15 minutes over. So this is a, a kudos to everybody on the quality of this discussion and a very lively chat. Love to see that. Mm -hmm. So um, if anybody would like to continue the conversation either with us or with any of our panelists, you can always reach us at info at Great Data Minds. Dot com and we'll be happy to um, make a connection uh, with wherever it makes sense. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, everybody uh, have a great day. Be happy. Be well. Thanks everyone. Take Thanks. care now. Thank you Take all. Care. Bye. Thank you. you guys. Take care. Have a good one.